Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And my time with you is very brief, at least in terms of up, being up here. So I'd like to launch right into this and uh, put food for thought. Two points. Uh, my slides tend to be very busy, so I won't cover every point, but it's food for thought and uh, as it might relate to the discussion. The other is I wanted to add to my presentation uh, the contributions to much of our work, uh, Dr. Manuel Barrera Jr. And so I've added him because uh, much of what I've done has really benefited from the synergy in our working relationship. And so I wanted to uh, mention his uh, work as well. There are two central questions that I'd like to cover. And uh, these were presented to me and I'm very happy to address them. One, are there clear boundaries between fidelity and adaptation? And two, what factors need to be considered when identifying appropriate adaptations of evidence-based programs? So let's start with the fidelity adaptation issues and challenges. And as a prelude, I'd like to say that I am not uh, against fidelity. In fact, I think it's absolutely essential. So I want you to know that. The issue is how we do it, how we put these two pieces together. And so first of all, with the clear boundaries question, I'd like to say that uh, mostly, yes, there are boundaries. But I think it's better to reframe the issue as you see there, fidelity and adaptation are two sides of the same coin. They're, the synergy is there. And I was struck by the fact that if you do fidelity well, as, uh, as Sharon had mentioned, you may actually be provoking the need or uh, creating the need for adaptation because something isn't working right. But isn't the challenge for us to make sure that our interventions work to the highest degree possible? So part of this two pieces of the same coin is let's do what's needed in order to get to the best outcome. So these are not pitted against each other. These are complementary approaches. The issue is when do we do which? So two, both are important then to maximize efficacy, and yet both are different in form and approach. So generally, you can't do them at the same time. You need to switch from one or the other. But as I said, both sequentially in whatever order for the purpose of maximizing efficacy or effectiveness out in the community. Are there clear boundaries? Um, again, the answer I think is to some degree, but there are many issues. Uh, fidelity was mentioned or fidelity, so I, I won't go into that. Let me focus on adaptation here. Is necessary when original intervention protocol exhibits significant mismatches with consumer needs or worldviews. And, and so, as such, continued implementation with fidelity is likely to significantly erode efficacy. So fidelity implemented in the wrong context when things are not working is going to work against the final bang for the buck. You're not gonna get what you're looking for. So we need to back up a step. Again, fidelity is critical. We do not want to shortchange it, but there may be a time when we can't implement a program exactly as prescribed when maybe the program doesn't fit or there's something wrong in the field. And we need to listen to the people in the trenches. They're the ones implementing it and they're saying, it's not working, time out, let's go back. And we need to listen. There's different issues there, but uh, with that said, we need to consider what's going on. There's, the, the program is not operating as intended. We need to back off a bit. Let me just mention briefly, the evidence-based movement uh, is specifically critiqued by people of color, special populations, um, because they felt that what evidence has accrued has not been relevant. It's not that evidence is bad, but if the evidence is not admissible in court, so to speak, you've got a problem. So let's fix it. Again, evidence is, is a good thing. And as a scientist myself, evidence is critical to getting to the heart of the matter but is the evidence a little bit out of tune with what's needed? Also from the field, bullet two, providers often felt that um, interventions were overly prescribed and culturally insensitive, and so they wanted to make the adaptations. In fact, from prior work uh, from Ringwald and others, it's evident that adaptations seem to be the rule rather than the exception. So something is happening in the handoff between the scientist and the provider. What's going on? Can we work with it rather than against it? By contrast, as you know, program developers see changes as compromising effectiveness. And that's actually true, because 
you put a lot of theory and thought and, and validation into your program. You don't want people to change it unless there's a really, really good reason, and often there isn't, unless, of course, the program doesn't fit, and then you have to revisit. So there again, as you can see, a spirited dialogue has occurred. But I think the dialogue should not be adversarial, although that can be good too. It really should be conciliatory in terms of how do we fix this? Because aren't we both after the same thing, which is the biggest bang for the buck? Okay, fidelity of implementation. Uh, let me, again, a wonderful presentation, so I, I don't I want to reiterate those points in the interest of time. Go back to the adaptation, uh, which is more the focus of my presentation. And I use EBI, evidence-based interventions, which is really equivalent to evidence-based programs. Uh, Dr. Barrera and I used interventions to talk about the two theaters of action in the area that we look at, which is treatment-related evidence and prevention-related evidence. So we felt that the umbrella term is intervention. So in principle, of course, high fidelity, uh, adaptation aimed at addressing sources of non-fit and mis from mismatch between intervention content, content and participant needs. Now, a key point here is that I've suggested here, just want to nail it down a bit more. An intervention, there in blue, not originally designed with the needs of a particular group is often unresponsive to their needs. That's been a complaint uh, from different populations of color that basically say this is neat except we can't relate to it or it doesn't quite fit our needs. But you don't have to be a person of color or population, special population to say that. Other mainstream groups have said kind of the same thing in different degrees. So with that as a point of concern, we need to do some problem solving. And as indicated, there are many interventions have been insensitive. I would say the core of that is the theory that was used was not central to their concerns. And I say to you that I think theory is also absolutely essential. But maybe the approach was not centered or not so much that a theory like social learning, social cognitive theory is bad, but some of the pieces were not as central to the concerns of a particular population. So I, I'm an advocate of taking base theory, expanding it so that we can do more to make it more relevant. Uh, let me just mention briefly these, uh, time is short of course. Oh, by the way, at the bottom I have the different references so you can follow along or look at articles that might relate to what I'm talking about here. Universal, uh, I think in principle, universal is really what would be ideal because we'd have an intervention that can be implemented broadly, but it's the ideal, not the reality. And so in some ways the term is unfortunate because one size does not fit all. That doesn't mean we don't want to make our intervention as penetrating and as expansive as we can, but we have to make sure that it works for the different sectors in the population. And I only talk about selective here and indicated as other approaches that the Institute of Medicine says are different types of programs, and these then require different levels of adaptation ideas, depending upon what the program tries to do. Let me just make passing reference to efficacy and effectiveness. This is the bottom line. Efficacy, of course, is under more controlled conditions, effectiveness under community conditions, and typically, of course, uh, it's harder to have effectiveness equal to efficacy because it's harder to do things in the uh, outside world. So efficacy then in principle is what we want to do. That's the indicator that our program works and, but it means that, and it means that they produce therapeutic change on targeted health outcomes and in a prescribed manner. So we want to be very explicit. In other words, we can make a program that tries to reduce drug abuse and then as a drug use in, in children and adolescents, but then maybe it makes them uh, feel happy uh, to, to go to school, which would be a great outcome, but it's not what the program was designed to do. So that is not uh, a good program in terms of the true definition of efficacy. And to that then, what I'm talking about can be encapsulated in the issue of relevance. In principle, a targeted change must be relevant and it must fit the need. For change to be therapeutic, it must be relevant in addressing important identified need or needs. With that, the uh, diversity need I mentioned, one size does not fit all. Ideally, yes, in, in practice, no. So we need to make some adjustments accordingly. And to the point I made before, universal programs, uh, I wish that there was true, but it's not. So we need to revisit that issue. 
Uh, moving along quickly, approaches then to adaptation, what factors need to be considered, and some of the, an article that uh, Dr. Barrera and I worked on uh, years ago, uh, just briefly, the most obvious need for adaptation is linguistic mismatches, and it was mentioned earlier. If I do a program in English and I implement it with Spanish speakers, by definition you must adapt because they won't understand. That's, that's a very simplistic case, but it's an obvious one that can be used as the basis for further thinking. Number two, comprehension mismatches. Folks un, uh, can, can understand to some degree what is being asked of them, but not enough so they can actually do it, and those are comprehension mismatches. And the most difficult one is cultural mismatches, because it involves a much richer but more complex set of issues around cultural values, beliefs, attitudes, expectations, and other things that are deep structure issues that cannot be ignored if you're going to make a program truly relevant to a target population. What factors need to be considered in identifying appropriate adaptations? Um, mentioned before here is reports from the field staff. Those are the ones in the trenches. And if, if they come to you, and they have come to me, saying this is not working as we planned, then there's several issues that need to be addressed. It may be that they're not doing it right, but it also may be the, that the program is not functioning as planned. One key point here, beware of misadaptation. And that's happened to me too, where staff just did what they wanted to, they didn't follow the rules, and it screwed up our program, okay? Not good. So of course I love fidelity, because you must implement as needed, unless of course there are compelling reasons not to do it, because what you planned is not what's out there. So staff arbitrarily changes content with no justification, that's misadaptation. Or staff eliminates or fails to present a certain content with no clear reason, that's misadaptation. We do not want misadaptation, okay? I won't go into these. These are from the Castro Barrera Martinez article, 2004. But just as we began to enumerate the different types of areas of mismatch, and under the big categories, you see there are several under group characteristics, um, others under, um, down here, program delivery staff. Things are not matching as needed. And then the last section here, administrative community factors. So that was our first effort to try to say, these are the areas where we must understand why things are not matched and we need to do something about it. Let me mention phases, or I should have put stages here, in formal intervention adaptation. And from the work that uh, Dr. Barrera and I have done, we've mapped out now from looking at other programs and what we've worked on, there is now a formal process. So the idea that uh, there is no clear way to do adaptations is no longer uh, an argument which is valid. And here you just see the, the four steps, information gathering, uh, review of literature, focus groups, etc. Number two, preliminary adaptation design. You recast something in a way that's going to fit, but it's only in a tentative way. Three, preliminary adaptation test. You pilot test, evaluate the changes that need to be made, and four, adaptation refinement, where you actually make the adjustment. This is a busy slide, but from the Barrera Castro article, 2006, Basically, the idea is there are two major theaters of action that we need to be concerned with. Engagement, which is a big area, and basically the argument that I've made is you can have the best and most wonderful program, but as mentioned before, implementation, which is part of the engagement, if folks don't come, then you can't have high efficacy or effectiveness. They didn't show up. And it's not, and the, one of the challenges in many minority or communities of color, we face that, which is one of the biggest single factors. How do you get folks to show up and then acquire the great content that we are trying to convey to them? Then, of course, there's outcomes. And I only call attention to the branch where when you see the evidence-based treatment, there is the conventional branch, which is a common mediator of effect and a common outcome. But there can also be unique adaptive element, which is the the branch below, and the unique mediator, which leads to a unique outcome. So this is the adaptation which gets at cultural issues. Finally here, uh, just sources of variation. Um, some evidence, uh, and I, I have to be brief here, types of adapta adaptation that have been discussed, cultural values and concepts, matching by native language, and treatment in clinically responsive clinics. This is different approaches in very broad strokes. Um, the other evidence basically says that there is some evidence that culturally adaptive interventions can be effective. 
Uh, the big question is whether they're more effective than the original, and the evidence indicates that they can be equally, but typically evidence is weak that they're better, although uh, there are challenges to that as well. Here's other types of adaptation here. Uh, simply the point to make is that special populations tend to require more adaptation. The Huey and Polo uh, study is less positive about whether adaptation uh, is really that uh, useful and effective. And there are other issues that I won't go into in terms of what other points are made regarding adaptation that uh, are important to look at. Um, there are issues of motivation, as you see, change facilitation, and responsiveness to diversity, all which are important elements. Future ideas, just briefly, um, hybrid interventions. Um, the ideal would really be that we incorporate adaptation and fidelity into a single intervention game plan so that we basically ground the program in the local community based upon its unique needs, and then once we know that the fit is really, really good, then we must adhere with fidelity to the revised or grounded program. Uh, culturally relevant theories, uh, I believe, is absolutely essential, and which is one of the big weaknesses. Many of the theories, especially as related to programs applied to special populations, are simply not vocal about what are their unique needs. And we need to then uh, work in that area because they, that should guide the design of uh, future programs that would fit a lot better from the very beginning. And as you see, consum consumer, uh, consumer and uh, developer partnership. A couple of very brief thoughts since my time is almost up. Randomized control trials, they are our gold standard. But my pitch is that the simple ones that just tell us did it work or not is not enough information for us. And what we need is those trials that include uh, mechanisms of effect, mediation analyses, so that we can truly understand the mechanism. And finally, a pitch for rigorous qualitative methods. Uh, as a measurement um, person myself, I love measurement. Uh, but I also believe that qualitative is a complement to that as it relates to nuances that are missed by scales and measures that exist. And uh, by combining them both in integrative mixed methods methodology, we ideally get the best of both. Thank you. <laughs>